Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm Terry Beecher, and I'm the National Director for Specialty Performers at SAG-AFTRA. And I think we could have another round of applause for Nigel and Kat. Very exciting to have them here. And the night's not over yet. This has been an amazing day. You know, we've been going all day long with events for dancers, starting with an agents panel. And I hope everybody here in this room, we have people in the Cagney room downstairs, and we're live streaming this. So I heard uh, that we have two people in Australia that are watching, along with some other people around the country. And I hope everybody out there can feel the love for dancers uh, that this whole day has been about. It's been great to uh, be able to bring this to you. And know that there are a lot of organizations that care about people who care about dancing, who are earning their living in dancing, or if you just love to dance. Um, one thing that Nigel did not mention, surprisingly, is that this Saturday, before the foundation, uh, the Dizzy Feet Gala, is National Dance Day. And there's all sorts of events around the country that you can participate in if you just go to their dizzyfeet.org. Um, and you can do participate in the dances, take part in some of the community activities, and we also have a Career Transition for Dancers, the SAG Foundation, SAG-AFTRA, Actors' Equity, and the Actors' Fund were all instrumental in bringing this day to you, and any number of those, any and all of us, are here specifically to help dancers and performers. And so I'd like to introduce you now, because the night just keeps getting better. Um, we have a, another panel of experts coming up, and to moderate that, we have a gentleman who has had many transitions in his interesting, interesting life. Uh, 15 years of dancing in film and theater and on stage, and then he became a writer and director and producer and had 35 years with Disney producing their live shows, um, Ringling, Barnum & Bailey Circus, Disney on Ice, and he also was writing all that time as a hobby about dancers that inspired him, Fred Astaire and the like. And uh, so that led to an encyclopedia that's been published about becoming dancers and choreographers. And so to uh, moderate this panel tonight, please welcome Larry Billman. Thank you, thank you. I got my circus tie on. Wonderful times. Anyway, I, that's really going to be tough to follow. You know that. So you're going to have to help me with that. I have never seen him so relaxed and, and having such a great time and being so physical. And it's wonderful that both he and Kat were here with us because they really kicked this off. We have a diverse group of people, which is very interesting. The whole... Uh, event that you're having is not only about dancing, where do you go after you stop dancing, uh, you know, what sort of help do you have, what sort of uh, encouragement through agencies and things like that. So we have uh, six different people from various areas of the, of the industry who all know something. Are you guys ready? First, I'm going to introduce, who needs no introduction, Adam Shankman. All right, come on in, take a seat. By the way, I thought he was going to have a heart attack and I was going to have to clean the fucker up. <laughs> For real. He can sit wherever he wants to. Uh, and, and I was going to give you their bios, which is redundant. You all take your programs home and study them. Because you... I've been around for a long time. I did very well. How about that? <laughs> I've been kicking around a long time. That's all you need to know. Okay. Next, I'm going to introduce Dana Hassan. Dana? <laughs> Grab a seat. Sit down. <laughs> Next, we have somebody that we weren't expecting and who graciously filled in. There was a lady, uh, la who, one of the producers of Glee, who tonight the whole Glee family is celebrating. 
a member of their family, so she had to be to that. And so we have Galen Hooks. Come on out. Next, we have someone who's on the show, which is a competition to So You Think You Can Dance. And I'm crazy for her. Her name is Kim Johnson from Dancing with the Stars. Come on out. You get to sit up high. Next, uh, a dance partner in crime of mine for a long, long time who really got the talent agencies all up on top of their game, a lady named Julie McDonald. Oh, yeah. And then last but certainly not least, and I first I found out his real name, Stephen <laughs> Twitch Boss. <laughs> and what I'm going to do with all of you, I'm going to ask a couple of questions individually. And if a question is asked and you're really passionate about it and you want to answer, choose me, choose me, pop in on it. Uh, I'm sure that won't be me at all. <laughs> <laughs> and then at the end, we will have questions from you, and then we'll do a wrap-up. There's a couple of questions. I'm going to ask them all as a group. I mean, there's one question. When did you find dance? I don't know. I think dance finds us. But I'd be very interested to hear what they have to say about it. So anyway, let me start with Mr. Shanton. Me? <laughs> Um, what dance? I mean, my, uh, not to be graphic, but my mother said that I cartwheeled out of her vagina. So I, so I would, I'm, I'm actually, she actually says that to strangers and people because she's very proud and, by the way, a sex therapist. So she's real free with her thinking and talk. <clears throat> um, but so I, I was raised in a household with a lot of musical theater and I, um, I, I danced around a lot and but I didn't take my first dance class um, until I, I got into Juilliard. And I auditioned like flash dance, never having taken a class, like literally, like in the leg warmers and maniac and the whole thing. And by the way, it was then, and I'm Jewish and I had the hair, so you know. So um, I, I took my first class there, but I had been doing theater and doing choreography for quite some time. Um, <laughs> And, um, but I was not formally trained, but it was always something that was, uh, I was very deeply passionate about. So, I don't know, it's, the word birth would be the answer. And he's gonna never stop dancing. Uh, what was the turning point of your career? Me? You. Um, well, my first agent could tell you that. Um, um, the turning point of my career, the turning point of my career was, um, what, the Oscars are you saying? Uh, uh, okay, no, actually, I was talking about, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the transition that you made, oh, not as a, about, as a director when you did that film, Cosmos Tale, right. but I don't remember your first jobs as a uh. dancer, really. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much my commissions meant to her. <laughs> no, what happened, what happened was um, I, 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 I dropped out of school, and I, because I knew um, at Juilliard they really just beat the heck out of you about uh, classical training, and you know, show dancing is not really a, a acknowledged there. And so, and that's what I was, I was a musical theater kid. So um, I just started auditioning and working in New York, and then, um, as every tale happens, had a bad relationship young and moved back to California, um, ended up in a Janet Jackson escapade in the escapade video and then she asked me to do the American Music Awards for her and then I got on the Oscars in 1990, uh, 1990 with, Paul. with Paula Abdul and then I was like oh my god I'm a Paula Abdul dancer and like like it's so <laughs> cool, fucking cool and um and the most significant thing about that was that was in 1990 and I never went to the Oscars again that was my experience with the Oscars until 20 years to the year later when I produced them and choreographed them. And that was 
so bitchin'. <laughs> like, you can't imagine. But my, so I, I, I was doing that. And then, but what happened, and you were there for this, was when I was dancing, after doing some stuff with Paula, um, it was a very, it was a time when industrials were really big. And I was, a, I was kind of a scrawny, real Jewishy looking kid, skinny, and that's not what Nike and Reebok were looking for. <laughs> and um, I wasn't getting jobs. And I booked my first choreography job by lying. Um, I was in a, I, well, it's, it, okay, come on. Um, they said, uh, somebody said to me, uh, I, oh, I was in a production office and they said, uh, I was bitching about not getting work, actually, to my roommate, who was a production supervisor, and the door swung open, and I'm no joke, they said, does anybody know a choreographer? It's an emergency, we need a choreographer right now, and I turned around, I'm a choreographer. <laughs> and I had not choreographed, and they said, who have you worked with? And I said, Janet Jackson and Paula Abdul. And they said, great, and they ran me over to uh, the director who was uh, one of the most prolific directors at the time, Julian Temple, and I did this, for, this one job for him and it, I never turned back. I, I just kept, I just booked him. And then, and you will remember this, my movie career was sort of um, on, sadly on blood because it was in one year we lost the two biggest movie uh, choreographers, Michael Peters and Lester Wilson, in the same year, and suddenly I was just standing there, and I got this sort of windfall of work. I was very, very lucky, but I was horrified to lose those two absolute idols of mine. How is that for a long answer to a short question? Great answer, great answer. Now I want to ask Dana the same two questions. was quickly tell us how you found dance. <laughs> well, <laughs> like a lot of, you know, young dancers, I started out at three. My mom just put me in, and I loved it, and I fell in love. And I continued through high school, and I really found it that I wanted to pursue a professional career when I was in college. Um, I was from a very small town where, um, about an hour north of Pittsburgh, where you graduate high school, you go to college. That's the order of things, and then you get married and have a family. So I went and got my psychology degree and then went to New York to become a professional dancer. So it was just a little different. Um, but in New York, I really found um, a passion for teaching dance, and uh, I did that for about three years, and then I moved to LA, and I um, reached out to Grover Dale, who is the founder of Answers for Dancers, the website, um, which I now work for, and um, I kind of found myself in a mentoring position. So I just, I love dance so much, I don't want to go away from it. So instead of really pursuing my professional performance career, I've found a mentorship, a teaching aspect of it that I really love. She did what Nigel described earlier. Okay, Galen, you're up. Yes. <laughs> How did you find dance and what was the turning point of your career? Um, I found dance. I grew up dancing when I was three as well, taking classes. I grew up um, about 45 minutes from here in a city called Walnut. Um, <laughs> small nut. Uh, <laughs> and so I started working when I was seven. I was on Star Search with a group. And we were the junior dance champs. And from that <laughs> point on, I got an agent. I think my first agency was Bobby Ball. Wow. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> Uh, so from the time I was seven till now, I've been dancing, and um, I transitioned into choreography maybe six years ago or so. Uh, so now I, I dance every once in a while if I'm choreographing on a job. Sometimes I'll dance, and LXD has been fantastic for that because I still get to express myself as a dancer, um, but not necessarily in your typical commercial sense. So that's amazing to have that outlet, to still be able to dance and choreograph and do everything was, I feel like in the past that that wasn't necessarily an option. Um, so that's how I found dance. And my turning point, uh, I think more there, there are personal turning points for me. When I, um, it's funny you were mentioning Nike. I, I did a lot of stuff for Nike, modeling for their dancewear line when they had a dancewear line, which unfortunately it didn't sell well in the States because people don't care about dancewear lines, but in Europe it's huge. Um, but 
there were tons of campaigns and it was in vogue and there were billboards and I loved that because it was about dance and it was promoting nothing but dancing and it wasn't dancing behind an artist and it wasn't selling a Coke bottle and it wasn't, it was about, there, there would be these little captions on it about I am woman, hear me roar, I am an athlete, speaking about what Nigel was saying about us being athletes and it was just a really empowering message so for me that was a really important moment. And another important moment for me, this is not career-wise, but I grew up um, in a dance company with Michael Rooney and Marguerite Derricks. They directed a company called Generation Next, and from the time I was 11 to 15, I was in that company. And I started assisting Marguerite when I was 13 or 14, and she means so much to me. She's been one of my greatest mentors. Um, but there was a class I took of hers, and since I've been dancing for so long, since I was three, it's like there's nothing else that I knew. I started working when I was seven. I didn't know what it was like to not dance. But there was a class I took, and we were going across the floor, and if anybody's ever taken her class, that is the scariest thing in the entire world, especially when you're freaking 11. <laughs> um, but there was just a moment where I realized that I loved dance. Whereas prior to that, it's like you don't really make the decision when you're three. You're in the classes because your mom puts you in the classes. But at a certain point, you have to decide that you still like doing it. And you're not just doing it because that's what your sister's doing. Um, so for that was a big turning point for me just as a dancer to go, oh, I would be doing this even if my mom hadn't put me in classes. And this is something that I really love to do. Um, those are really random turning points, but personally for me, those are those have been important throughout my career. Great. Kim, Kim Johnson. Um, well, I come from Australia, uh, from Sydney, and again, I was three uh, when I was put into dancing, of course, um, as most little girls are. Um, I did ballet, jazz and tap, um, and acrobatics and singing and all that sort of stuff when I was little. Uh, I didn't find ballroom dancing, which is what I'm known for now, until I was probably 13 or 14. And it's a funny story, my brother, um, who doesn't dance, uh, was um, interested in a girl at school who did ballroom dancing. <laughs> so uh, he asked my mum if he, if he could go do ballroom dancing, and mum was like, really? Okay. Um, so it was so strange for him to want to do ballroom dancing. So my mum would take him to these ballroom lessons and I thought I was a real dancer, you know, doing ballet, jazz and tap and more musical theatre stuff. And um, I thought ballroom dancing was something, you know, my grandparents did because uh, it wasn't popular. Um, and then I would go with my mum to, to, you know, wait for him to, to finish and then there was a little boy that needed someone to dance with. So I sort of stepped in and found that I really enjoyed dancing with a partner instead of just, you know, I was doing my RED exams and just, you know, really working hard as a dancer myself. And I found so much joy in dancing with someone else and then fell in love with the ballroom. But I kept up my other um, styles of dancing, which, tr you know, helped me tr tremendously uh, in ballroom dancing and especially now in Dancing with the Stars. I think having that background um, in musical theatre helps me choreograph uh, these ballroom numbers and... And also, as a child, I think a turning point for me was um, every Sunday I would watch um, an M MGM movie and I fell in love at a very young age uh, with all of the, you know, the MGM classics. And um, I would... I, I remember my mum got me a book of all the different movies and I would go and, like, pick which one I wanted for Christmas or my birthday and she'd get me a different one. So I've got, like, a whole library of MGM movies. But that definitely, um, you know, made me love dance so much and... Uh, I've just been dancing ever since. Yeah, uh, Nigel talked about Jerome Robbins earlier. <laughs> Jerome Robbins only got into dancing because he had to accompany his sister to dance class. That's happened several times. The, you know, the song, I can do that from chorus line, that's what it's all about. <laughs> you know what's so interesting? That, I mean, and, and, and this is not really, so, this is just riffing on the MGM thing. There is... I, a, a fairly obscure Lauren Bacall musical called Designing Woman. I don't know if anyone of you know. Okay, so in that movie, what's very interesting, going back to what they were talking about, sexuality, Jack Cole is in it and plays a choreographer who is accused of being, uh, they didn't use the word gay, I don't know, of being a sissy or something. Uh, yeah, and there's this crazy scene where he beats up all these bad guy bullies in like the craziest ballet, like, you know, total <laughs> butt mod, you know, off a trash can, and does that, and he's like, now see who's gay, as they're all like lying on the ground. 
at, but what's so brilliant about it is that it's Jack Cole himself who probably suffered through that so much, you know, and as I'm looking at Patricia. Um, um, but that is a really interesting because the fact that it, in a movie from the 1950s, carried through that actual storyline of the accusation of being gay as a dancer because you dance, although he did literally, I think it was Vincent Minnelli directed it, he had him literally dance around the set every scene he was in. He was never stopped dancing, like ever. Like during dialogue scenes, he was just always moving and jumping on tables and like things like that. So I, I, would, I wouldn't call him gay, I would call him psychotic. But. Yeah, Jackie Chan admits he used to watch Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire movie. And that number is one of the first martial arts beats dance things, which now, everywhere you look, Everything is morphing into everything else. Movement is movement is movement is movement. Julie McDonald. All right, I'll try to keep this short. Um, I, I'm another person who started dancing, not at three, at, but at five. So I don't have... Late. I, I, I didn't have as much experience as, you, as the rest of you. But uh, ballet in Bellevue, Washington with Dorothy Fisher and, and Novikov, a Russian... And a uh, very serious ballet, and I really loved it. I can just say I, I loved it so much, and I really took to it, and I was on point in the whole line yards. My family moved to L.A. many moons ago, and I kind of stopped the ballet, and I got into modern dance and all of that sort of thing, and I, I toured with a couple of local companies, and I, 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 I dropped out of college to tour with companies, and I really loved that. And then in 19, well, I'm not telling you the year, but uh, a, a few decades 32. ago. 32. <laughs> a few decades Thanks. ago, myself and two other women, one of whom is here right now, Myrna Garwin, we started a dance studio in Venice called Room to Move, and it was really a big turning point in my life because it was a magical place. It was, it was a place and a, 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 and a time, and all of the... All of the um, uh, the elements in the universe came together to create something really special and I met a lot of people who I'm still friends with today. A lot of my first clients were from my dance studio. It was an amazing place in Venice. There was nothing in Venice then. There wasn't even any roller skaters there then. You know, and it was it was like magic. I said, 1932. No, not that, not that long ago. And I'm gonna tell an Adam <laughs> Shankman anecdote. But anyway, <laughs> No, it really was great, and then um, <clears throat> uh, this, we, we, we decided to close that down. I was teaching all over town, and pretty lost, actually, and then I got this huge, terrible knee injury, and I had to reinvent myself, and I became an agent for dancers, and, and the t at the time when music videos were just at their peak, and it was a really good time to start um, um, a, a new kind of uh, venture. So I had no idea what I was doing, but um, it, 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 the time was right, and, and uh, I've had the privilege to re represent some of the most extraordinary people working today. It's really been my great privilege. And Adam was one of my first clients, and he, I have to just say something about Adam. 1934. Ah, ah, Adam. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how many of you are dancers in here or wanting to <clears throat> embark on new careers or in the middle of trying to make your own career work, but I have never seen anybody so ambitious in my life in a good way. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, and drinks, always with somebody. Remember, you were... Mostly out, drinks. Mostly <laughs> drinks, but he really, really wanted this success very, very badly, and then... I mean, and then he made this film, and it got him in this little short film with dancers, and it got the door open for him, and it really was a remarkable thing to witness. Everybody in the community is really proud of you, because you. you really, really transitioned from dancer to choreographer to director to producer. That is something that not a lot of people achieve. <laughs> Thank so, you. So being in the being, 
being in the business that I am and the thing that I'm most proud about is making, is transitioning people. Because choreography and dance is a transitional career. Not for everybody, not for everybody. There are those people who have very long careers as choreographers, but I think it's getting harder and harder to maintain that. You have got to make a change. You can go into everything that Nigel said is right. Dance is a foundation for a lot of great things in, 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 that you can go in many different directions. I became an agent. And I'm still involved in the dance community. I, I am so fortunate. I mean, dance surrounds me on a daily basis. Dancers, choreographers, but it's the transitioning of the talent because we are in a transitional business. Dancers, some of them become singers. Some of them become actors. Some of them become producers. Some of them become union activists. Some of them become m more than one thing at once. And, and it's really, it's a, it's a daily challenge, let me put it that way. That people don't want to stand still when they're dancers. They want to move on. So and I will, but I will tell you this. I will tell you this in, in, uh, in no uncertain terms. No matter what job I am doing, what career, you know, if I'm producing, whatever, blah, 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 that doesn't matter. I will always self-identify as a dancer first and foremost. Everything else is what I do. Dancer is who I am, period, end of story. <laughs> you, do, you, do you see why I let him have center? Twitch, okay. How, when did you start and what was a turning point in your life that determined that you were going to dance? Okay, okay. so um, for me, dance is always, it's literally, it's been a part of my culture. So it's not, about, um, it's not about finding it or when I started. I was literally adopted into it, you know what I mean? So with me, I'm from Montgomery, Alabama, right? A, it's down south. B, black family, right? So family reunions, we're dancing. All day, no matter, yeah, I am black, believe it or not. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, so dancing is something that, that has... Revelation. Exactly. <laughs> it's always been absolutely natural, and it's, it's honestly been the most natural thing for me. I was not one for academics and things like that, but dancing, you turn a song on, there's a talent show, I'm dancing. That's what I'm doing. Right, so with that being said, as I went through my, my school career in high school, around 11th grade, I wasn't really, really doing anything that was pushing me, right? But um, I heard over the intercom that there were tryouts for the high school dance team. So uh, I was like, that, that, might, that might be all right, that might be okay. Um, because granted, I'd never taken a dance class before or anything like that, but I remember walking into the tryouts and uh, I was the only guy, and when I walked in, there were about 40, 50 girls, you know, stretching and getting ready and stuff like that. And then, and, and they asked me, they were like, you in the right place? I was like, yeah, 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 I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and here I am, no. Uh, uh, <laughs> and seriously, from there, it was just a snowball effect. It's when everything fell into place. I found my focus, what I wanted to do. I went on to community college. And then I went. On, I transitioned out to uh, Chapman University to uh, study dance education, which brought me to yeah, I went to Chapman. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> to study uh, dance education. Um, and honestly, at that which kind of feeds into the other question, that was a huge turning point of my career because in Alabama it wasn't really the dance hub. You know what I mean? <laughs> this was this was pre this was pre YouTube. You know, so. I could, I could have been very comfortable, I, I really could have, I could have been very comfortable teaching dance and maybe opening a studio in Alabama teaching very bad dance habits, very bad, because I, I, had, I had none myself. But uh, the turning point was really coming out and exposing myself to all the knowledge and uh, all the history that there is, because it's vast, and at the time I had no idea. So um, to keep it short and sweet, that was, that, that was how I found it, and a very very big turning point for me is leaving Alabama. I'm now gonna, I'm yeah, now yeah, gonna I'm pop, to no, I'm gonna get to pop around. You all now can feel and smell and hear their passion for what they do. I'm now gonna kind of jump around to the different topics that we wanna talk about. 
What I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, talk about the whole new media that is allowing dance to happen. And I want to talk to Galen about that. Tell us about new media and how you see it changing the landscape of dance and dancers. It's dramatic. Um, geez, I mean, it's a whole different world now. It's a whole new world. Um, I'm a Disney freak, sorry. Everything <laughs> relates to Disney, whole new world. Um, but <laughs> yes, John's, John Chu, well, s starting with LXD for me, that's, that's the epitome of what you can do with the internet and dance. Because it was creating a story based on dancers with the dancers as the stars, and the focus was on the dancers. Um, and it had three seasons on Hulu, up there with like Family Guy was, was number one on Hulu and we were number two. It's like, well, people are actually watching stories built on dance. Um, which I think is amazing compared to YouTube, which is also amazing, but to be able to put that into the industry setting and create an, an actual series built on it, I th just thought was unbelievable and it created such great opportunities for us that wouldn't have ex ex existed in the past. Um, and off of that, which was John Chu's project, LXD, he spawned D Studio, which was a YouTube channel. Um, and it, it just, it changes everything because you can be in Africa, you can be in Japan, and you can be watching this premium content that is produced so high quality that it sh could be shown on TV. LXD, could, we watched the screenings of the seasons in theaters, and it's, it is top quality stuff. And I was fortunate enough to have a show on John's channel called Masterclass where I basically profiled the top choreographers of our day, Fatima Robinson, Travis Payne, Brian Friedman, Tina Landon, just the, the, the best of the best. And I just love that because people in LA don't even know who some of these people are because our, the gen, it's just there's, there's such a, a high rotation of dancers and you, it's hard to keep up for them with who the people of our past are. So not only to educate people in LA, but people all over the world who would have no access to these choreographers and they would teach a tutorial of iconic choreography that they've done. You, we can't even take class from these people here. And you can live in Idaho or live in Montgomery, Alabama, Alabama and be taking classes from these people online and hearing their stories and, and learning all of this. And it's, it just, it changes the game entirely. So, I mean, new media in general, you, I mean, you have to mention YouTube because that is changing everything and people are, have hundreds of thousands of Twitter followers because they're YouTube dancers and have mil their, their views, they have videos on YouTube that have over a million views um, and can make a living going around the world and teaching based off of YouTube, yeah. which is fantastic. Um, it's just about what we do with that and it's changing the landscape because now everybody has an opportunity to be a part of the pool and now it's not just, there, there's, there's an industry side of dance now and there's a community side of dance which is dance crews and there's the, it's still the underground world and there's the YouTube world and there's just all these different um, fractions of the dance community but now everybody has an opportunity to share what they do with the entire world whereas in the past it was, you were gonna be a backup dancer. <laughs> You were gonna try to work in commercials. There, that's when I grew up dancing. It was the be all end all was to dance behind Janet Jackson or Britney Spears or In Sync, and it was that was that was it. Now dancers have clothing lines. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> clothing lines that sell well. No. You know, <laughs> it's it's a whole different ball game. Yeah. 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 Julie, yes. Yeah, yeah, I can speak to that too because we've seen such a huge monumental shift in what's going on with dancers. One thing that you said, the dance choreographer teachers are actually making more money mm -hmm. teaching than they are choreographing, yep. and these the young generation with huge followings, huge followings on on on, on YouTube, and Twitter, they have hundreds of thousands of followers, and as Galen just said, they are in demand to teach. So where teaching used to be a sideline. Now it's the main event in a lot of people's careers. And it's just, it's fascinating. I and mean, everybody knows that the future is on the internet. I mean, it is. I mean, it was, the Emmys, this nominations just actually proved it with all the Netflix shows getting all these Emmy nominations. I mean, it's the way of the future. As you just said as well, we don't know exactly where it's going or how it's going exactly, but it's really, it's really there. 
It's arrived. Yeah. Nigel, I heard you say that, um, so you think you can dance was about to end or die or whatever it is you said, so I have a Netflix thing I want to talk to you about later, okay? <laughs> Through Facebook, yeah, he wow! Did. You know, I, it, you know, that's a an interesting thing because um, for our, for we're doing uh, unbelievably, we're doing and yet another Step Up movie, and um, I know it's Step Up Five. Let's save the world again with our battle, you know. <laughs> so, um, but um, the amount of people, that's how we're finding a lot of people because our audition process can't span the entire world, and because. People like John Chu and Scott Spears wanted people that were so incredibly unique. Um, people were auditioning online, and we are, it looks like, flying people, somebody in from New Zealand. It looks like we're flying two people in from France um, to be in this. So uh, that's a game changer. That's a major, I mean, what? oh, you couldn't make this audition because I live in, you know, Taiwan? Guess what? I can still audition, you know, and if you, if you know the right way to do it. Yeah. The casting process has completely changed because even, especially in the music industry, when things happen so last minute and they're like, we're shooting a video tomorrow and you need eight dancers and it's not, there's not always the preparation that you enjoy on a film of having thought out casting processes and people, not only do I get a lot of times, it's, it's like a twofold thing. Sometimes um, people will say, I want to hire this person, but uh, do they have any video on any video on YouTube that I can see before? Because they don't have time to do a casting, mm -hmm. and if you don't have anything up there, you're just screwed. It's like you can't, you how can you sell yourself? Or even headshots. People go on Facebook to find headshots of people. Yeah. You, it, it's just, it's just different. Madonna actually hired one of uh, one of her choreographers from um, YouTube. I was really happy we represented that person, but <laughs> <laughs> but that's how that's how she found them. Yeah. I was really at fantastic. first fantastic, just fantastic. I want to ask Kim about. Um, I, I just read a review, a wonderful review for Max and Karina from Dancing with the Stars, opening on Broadway and getting the best review of the whole thing, Forever Tango. What sort of opportunities are now being opened to you and? How are you trying to parlay all of that into your next step? Uh, well, that's the beauty about um, shows like So You Think You Can Dance, Dancing With The Stars. Um, you know, it does give you a platform where you can be seen by so many people, um, what you do. Uh, so it does open so many doors. I um, did Burn The Floor, um, which Jason Gilkerson choreographed. I was actually um, in the original um, cast of it, and I was 12. Um, <laughs> no. Um, so I was in the original and I did that for six years on and off, travelled the world, uh, which was, you know, the best um, grounding really to, to sort of expand my dancing in a way. And I learned so much from Jason Gilkerson. And then I was lucky enough to get on Dancing with the Stars in Australia actually first. Um, and then actually they saw some clips of me here in America and that's how I ended up coming over. Um, to, to the States. I, I was like so surprised when they asked me to come over. Um, it's quite a funny story. I'd, I'd only had sort of hot young guys in Australia that I danced with. So when they called me to come over, I was thinking, oh, I'm honestly like, I'm going to get George Clooney or some hot guy. Like I was delusional. I thought I was going to get someone like that. And I was on the plane trying to think who I was going to have, maybe Andre Agassi or something. And um, I turn up to the studio and the producers said, okay, well, you've got Jerry Springer. <laughs> And I, I've just flown from Australia. And I, I just went, oh, oh, okay. And, you know, I'd, I'd choreographed for, like, young, hot people. I'd never sort of choreographed, you know, for an older gentleman. So I was thinking, what am I going to do with him? Like, and then I remember he walked in the door and the first thing he said to me, he said, I'm sorry. <laughs> and it was the sweetest, he was the sweetest. And I actually grew so much from teaching him. Um, I had to become quite a comedian um, and make my dances very theatrical and try and disguise, you know, some of his lack of movement. Um, like, like of skills, but he was, um, you know, so adorable and actually Dance with the Stars opened up doors for him even and he's, you know, Jerry Springer. He was seen obviously doing his 
show that he does um, and after Dance With The Stars, he was then hosting, I think, America's Got Talent, you know, family show. So that helped him. And then for me, I went on to do Burn The Floor um, after I was doing Dance With The Stars here on Broadway, uh, which I was a dream of mine. I couldn't believe I was headlining on Broadway. I, it was just so surreal. Um, you know, dancing in, in Vegas. Um, and I'm sort of in that transitional stage right now um, where I, it's sort of... Uh, my career's sort of gone into more hosting, presenting, things like that, which, you know, I didn't expect. So there's definitely so many doors that have been opened, business opportunities as well. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very exciting time and um, my career sort of still, you know, doors are opening, which is very exciting. Yeah, fascinating. It, but I, I want a bachelorette with her and all the guys have to be able to dance. Wouldn't that be fun to watch? Okay, now I'm gonna go to, um, she made a funny face, did she? Okay, um, to you, with Answers for Dancers, which we can't thank Groverdale enough for that, all of that that he has done for dancers. In getting and keeping an agent or a job, what criteria are, or skills are most important for dancers, young dancers, to be aware of these days? To get an agent or a job? Keep well, well, or a job? Keeping. Well, ultimately, one major goal for any dancer, you know, would be to get an agent. So what we do on our website, um, we have a social networking feature that's called I Dance To. It's a really encouraging, positive, amazing community that kind of built itself. Uh, we didn't know what was gonna happen when we launched it, but members are supporting other members and giving feedback on videos that they're um, uploading to you know create their own demo reels. And so we've now featured these members who create what we call killer reels. Um, that you know are really showing them in the best light and showing their versatility and showing that they can become professional working dancers and are on the level to go and have agent representation and go on to the bigger jobs that may not be available without an agent behind them. So I think that preparing yourself, knowing what to expect in an agent-client relationship, knowing to, you know, check in with them, let them know what's going on with you, not just kind of fall off the radar and expect them to do everything for you. It's a relationship. Um, so having your headshots, being open to um, criticism, you know, constructive criticism, and knowing how to work on yourself in order to become the dancer and the professional that you want to present to the world. So I think that, um, you know, just knowing all of these skills, headshot, website, reel, all of these things kind of go cohesively in order to present a package to, you know, to an agent or to a choreographer, a director, somebody who's gonna hire them. Reputation is very, very key. And Julie, everybody knows this, dancers uh, can be very flaky. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if a better gig comes along, Dancers will abandon jobs, and that pisses off everybody. And um, it's very hard if you do not act totally professionally, and that's a very different, that's something you don't learn in a dance studio, is how to behave with professionalism and respect. And there's always gonna be a better job around the corner. Or sometimes there's not, and you think it is, and then it's really, it turns out a very bad because you've burned a bridge, and then, you know, Julie gets calls and everybody's screaming and, and it's, it's really unpleasant. Mm -hmm. But I, I wish at some point, you know, it, in every dance studio there was like some sit down seminar where people were taught to act in a professional manner and make, uh, make decisions mm -hmm. in a more, uh, uh, with, with the umbrella, with the macro in mind, you know? Well, uh, I work with Dancers Alliance a lot, which is basically a group of dancers and choreographers that donate our time to improving the rights and working conditions for professional dancers and choreographers, which Julie was one of the founders of. Mm -hmm. um, and we are, we've been talking to the agencies about doing a mentorship program 
twice a year. There's a meeting. Once you sign with the agency, you have to go to this meeting. It, you get the ins and outs of what, because people move here and they're like, what the hell am I doing? And through Dancers Alliance, we can create some sort of template for even the veterans to go to these meetings and go, oh, that's what I should have been doing this whole time. So it's just exactly what you're talking about, sitting down, anyone who's trying to be a professional dancer, talking about the agent relationship, talking about getting your headshots, talking about all of that stuff so that they have somewhere to get that information. Yeah, maybe that's why we were called gypsies, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it was fun, and if you didn't like the temperature and you didn't like the job, you never showed up again. You can't. There are I thought it was because we steal. <laughs> that too. So I find that the agencies are now really stepping up and answers for dancers. There are places for dancers to go to. I don't think we need to be out, hey, does anybody want to be a dancer? I think the dance community itself has to realize that there is help, there is advice, there is support, and all of that. I want to talk to Twitch. In looking in your, your bio, you have a line of clothes, and I want to ask you about how you, what kind of guidance are you getting into use your persona for all kinds of things rather than just as a dancer? Well, it's, it's really important, that, and it's been mentioned up here actually, is that, um, that you know, the show, the show that I was part of, uh, So You Think You Can Dance, was, it was a huge, huge platform. Um, and I think that's the, that's the misinterpretation for it sometimes is that um, sometimes people get on the show and think that um, once they've been on it, they can sit back and chill and things are going to come to them um, for, from the exposure that they have that people are going to then bring them things. But you still have to hit the ground running. So with that being said, um, there, are, there are lots of things that you can, you can dive into, you know what I mean, uh, from all of a dancer's needs, from clothes to music. Um, I, I love acting. I'm really jumping into acting right now. So with that being said, the platform that So You Think set up for me, has uh, it, it, it really helped with those things because the exposure now, rather than just telling a friend, like, hey, Galen, I got some clothes. You want to, you want to just, you know, <laughs> you, you know, hey, hey, Julia, I got some clothes. You think you, you think any of their clients will like the clothes? You know, it, now you have, you have things like Twitter and all that, and the exposure now, ha you, you have a voice that will be heard, and, and people will go, oh, well, I'll have to check that out. Not necessarily saying, oh, well, I'll buy them, that, but you're at least saying, Oh, I'll check, I'll check that out, I'll check that out. And, and it's more than just word of mouth, it's a, a mere whisper, you know? And, and those things, they really, really help. I think those are very necessary in a dancer's transition and longevity of whatever they wanna do, whether it be clothing, whether it be teaching, whether it be um, moving into another avenue of performance, that platform is very necessary. And also the knowledge to actually keep running once you're off the platform. Um, uh, it's just to never get too comfortable because uh, um, nobody's going to really bring you anything, you know, and that's what's helped with me. Everybody go home and like Twitch tonight, okay? <laughs> Fasc fascinating, just fascinating. Um, I want to go back to Adam. I'm all over the board, but Adam, because he has such active tear ducts, um, oh. <laughs> I want to ask him how he feels about me fumbling through my papers. Um, how do you see the artistic value of dance evolving along with the integration of various styles of dance? Mm -hmm. And is emotional content being sacrificed for pushing physical limits in today's competitive training? You just asked me 19 <laughs> questions. <laughs> okay, uh, yes, okay. Um, Okay, in terms of the evolution, what I would say is that the shows, like uh, So You Think, Dancing with the Stars, Dance Crew, YouTube, everything that everybody sees are shoving the uh, physical boundaries really, really high. And everybody is becoming very, it's like, sort of like the Olympics where the compulsories when I was young in gymnastics were like, I did, I did like a one and a half or whatever, you know what I mean? And now it's like if you can't, if you're a guy and you can't do a quadruple, you're screwed. So it's like, you know, so everything just keeps building on itself. Um, and 
uh, just in terms of those things. I look at like super serious b-boys right now and they just look like wheelchair candidates to me. Like I don't even understand, that's like the you know United Cripples of America to be, you know, because I'm scared. I don't know how a body could withstand that kind of stuff. I mean, I didn't do half that shit and I had seven knee surgeries, you know, so. Um, I, I, you know, that's the other thing that I know Nigel meant in talking about with Dizzy Feet and all that. We really, really want to explore what it is to do this, you know, sort of hip hop syllabus and curriculum and try to figure out how to teach kids to take care of themselves doing these things because it's just the injury rate is just too crazy. Um, I do not think at its highest level that anything is sacrifice, any emotional content is being sacrificed. Um, what, I, what I think is that studios by and large are churning out kind of robots. And I, I, you know, we see these contemporary dancers who are pushed really high, uh, you know, and jazz dancers, modern dance, like those things, to do all these crazy tricks, but they have no feeling at all. I mean, it is, it's actual, it's actually to watch it, it's kind of torture. Because like, when we go out and do our regional auditions, you have these guys and girls who can do things and you can always tell the convention dancers and the studio dancers. And convention is not a bad word, but it, it, but it can produce bad uh, performers. Thank you, who said that? For, so was, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, and there's literally no performance. It's this, I'm, and, and by the way, it's always to some song that is so torturous <laughs> and so over emotive and like, like that. And the people are just doing things and they're just sort of, you know, jumping and falling and splitting. And it's all, and by the way, they always only have one leg. And I'm always like, if you want to get on the show, show me the other fucking leg. Uh, <laughs> uh, back then we didn't have assisted bot Molly. That leg went up or it was not up. Um, but, um, but, but, um, wow, by the way, does anybody have a gurney <laughs> to get me out of here? No, um, but I believe that there is that segment, that cream that rises to the top, are the ones who actually are the true artists, and they're just not students. You know what I mean? They're, you know, those are the kids that come up through dance school and don't have that moment where suddenly, like, oh, geez, this is what it's all about. You know, they're just like in there and they, you know, they just want to be there. You know, I mean, God bless them, but the worst representation of that is dance moms yeah. right now. You know, I mean, it's just watching these, you know, toddlers and tiaras being shoved through the system at like cookie cutters and beaten them up emotionally. And, you know, I know a lot of that is for TV and I, you know, and I, and I know how they edit it and all of that. But you do get a glimpse in, uh, uh, I think, a, not a completely unrealistic glimpse inside the, um, um, the uh, studio system, that studio system. I was just going to say one thing about, about the, um, the, the, the dancers. Not only are they, they're being taught by people maybe a few years older than they are. And they're, they're, the teaching has, and, and I don't mean this for everybody, because there's good academies everywhere, and in every... Every small town in America, there's incredible teachers. I mean, we see it all the time, but what's happened a lot as a result of YouTube and of this is that they want the, pop, the people with all the followers, but they're 20 years old. How, you know, teaching is a skill. It's a craft. It's not, a great dancer doesn't make a great teacher. I was a teacher, I, I was shocked about what a horrible teacher I was. And it, no, 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 I was. And it took me four years before I felt like, oh, I can teach now. And it's just, everything is on such a fast track that this craft of teaching something of meaning to dancers, that's sort of falling by the wayside. Speaking of a good teacher, and I just want to say something, when we had our studio back in Venice in the day, Michelle Zeitlin, who's here. Is Michelle here? She's here. No? No, oh, she's not. Oh, she was. Oh, it's Tina. Tina. Hi, Tina. Well, how did I think you were Michelle? I am so embarrassed. I'm sorry. Anyway, I thought you were Michelle Zeitlin. I was going to say hi. Uh, <laughs> wow, awkward in any case. Yeah, very um, awkward. No, um, no um, the... 
but again, and I think that Can this is really, out? I think this is really important. I think what's really important is that these dancer, these teachers, these young ones, they really don't have that sense of history. They right. don't understand where we came from. Right. They don't know who Nureyev was. They don't know who Nijinsky was. They do not know what the Ballet Trocadero de Monte Carlo is. They do not know who Michael Kidd was. They do not know who Robert, um, I mean, obviously we could go on forever. Right. Uh, would you like me to? No, um, <laughs> no but I mean, and, and, but I think that, you know, it's Mia Michaels actually came over um, to my house and she had, and I don't even remember who the choreographer was, but she had never seen, God, I'm so gay. This is so gay. But I, she had never seen any of the old Mitzi Gaynor specials. And, and I was like, what are you talking about? It's like the greatest thing you've ever seen. It's, you know, the beginning. Uh, so I, and she, nobody knew that Herbert Ross had done all the old Judy Garland stuff, you know? And I was like, I got to teach you this shit? Are you kidding me? So I put it on and she was just like, whoa. You know, I mean, she couldn't believe it. And then the next thing I saw was a whole tribute to it on So You Think You Can Dance Canada that she did. Uh, by the way, using uh, set pieces that looked like my living room, which was weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but, but, you know, that rich history can inform so much. Kim, when you were talking about, I mean, it, doesn't it inform all of your work with... Completely. Um, you know, I get so inspired by those movies. Like, uh, Mitzi Gaynor, she's one of my favorites of all time. Um, yeah. People don't know who Virginia Mayo was. People don't know, you know, nobody. Uh, well, Sid Charisse, uh, you know, I mean, obviously. I could just sit and watch all those movies, you know, all day. I And I was really young, like, you know, it was kind of a strange thing, I guess. Uh, a lot of my friends, they weren't interested in watching those movies. Um, but I would sit there by myself and... They didn't want to watch Girl Hunt from the bandwagon? <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. So, I don't know, I, you know, I'd go around singing all the songs and trying to do all the dances. And I, my mom actually had a dance floor put me um, downstairs. And I'd go, get down there by myself, you know, pretending I was Mitzi Gaynor or Vera Ellen or Sid or something. Oh, Vera Ellen. <laughs> Nigel, Nigel mentioned all of that too, but I always try to be an optimist, then it's our job to teach them. We really can't be down on anybody that they don't know. They have not been introduced to it. You know what's really strange? When I did Hairspray, which the lovely Twitch was in, when we were doing the auditions, the dancers didn't know what a pony or a mashed potato was, <laughs> which was really, really rough on me. Because I was like, <laughs> oh God, if you, you can't like, yeah. You know what that is? Like, oh, like, really? I'm having to really teach this thing? Like, yeah. that was really uh, disappointing because that's, like, literally, that was street dances of our exactly. early culture. Exactly. Exactly. It's all fleeting that it comes back again. I guarantee you it'll be back, you know. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Can I just but piggyback for just a second? It just goes, oh. goes with what Nigel was saying. And also the point that I was trying to get out of him about... He always cries when someone affects him emotionally. I do too. It's, I don't care, the arms may be funny, but something's coming out of their inside that they're living it. And it gives me a chill as I talk about it. And Nigel talked about that too. At their auditions, it's not the best dancer, it's somebody who transforms the room yeah. that we're looking for. So I'm afraid that so many of these kids that can stand there like a bird and put one leg against their... It looks like rhythm gymnastics. It doesn't look like dance. You that's know what, but the kids who watch the show also see that, and they see what moves us and all of that. So I get concerned about like when they come in and they think that just doing that is going to give us some sort of something if they're not giving... Like the, the most sort of famous see me breaking down thing was when Billy Bell auditioned. Mm -hmm. And being in the room when that actually happened was one of the most shocking, bizarre, transformative experiences I had because there was this kid who's, we didn't know if he was in or out. I mean, he, he was so wiry and he was obviously a beautiful dancer. We didn't know about his partnering or anything like that. Alex, when Alex auditioned, it was like, oh, he's, he's won already. You know what I mean? It was like, it was because you were just so strong. And then of course we couldn't get you, um, but, but, when Billy did it, we didn't know what was going on inside there. And his audition, and again, forgive the language, was such a, oh, I'm not good enough? Fuck you. It was, you are, no one tells me I'm not good enough. 
and we were, we were all completely schooled. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I had a total nervous breakdown because I, I was holding Mia going like, what is he doing to us? What is he doing to us? Like it was, it was, but it was transformative and he was, he was just dancing and living it. And, uh, but that's rare, those are, those are dance stars. But I, I th and I think what, what comes from that is it's, um, it's quite a catch-22, actually, because uh, being on, on the hip-hop side of things, literally st starting in, in hip-hop and continuing on with the education of it, I can, go out, I can go outside of my class and then go watch a contemporary class or, or, or a jazz class, a lyrical, whatever. And the way that the teachers talk to the students um, is, is that's what brings out that transformative um, character. And what's happening is it's kind of what Julie was saying is, is that you have these that are just put into showing you what I call hot eights. They're not really teachers, they're there to show you hot eight, hot eight counts. You know what I mean? So with that being said, you're not, the students aren't taking anything away with them. How to then um, relate maybe their own life stories, their passions, their, their transgressions. They're not able to uh, re relay those things through their choreography because they're just shown steps. They're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not taught about feeling and, and how to relate it to your life. You're, ju you're just really being programmed. You know what I mean? And, and I think that that is the, the huge difference in, in why it's such, um, our art form is in such a fragile state is because there's a lot of spectators right now. You can click YouTube and everything is at fingertips, but elbow grease is a foreign concept right now. You know what I mean? Elbow grease is a very, very foreign concept. Speaking um, of like emotion in dance, um, I work with the Down Syndrome Association of LA and I teach them dance. And the emotion that they have when they dance is absolutely out of this world. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I was t doing a, like a course and I had ran it for about eight weeks and I had 80 um, students from four to the age of like, I think 45. And we were going, we were putting on an event for their, um, for their buddy walk. And it was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done is, is teaching them and just the joy that they have. And that's what dance is all about, I think. So yeah, they're amazing. Yeah, it truly is. I don't know. I mean, again, I'm referring to Nigel. He referred to a standard of education, dance education. I, we may be the only country that doesn't. You know, Mama Boo or whoever she is can teach class. So right. that's where right. the danger is. They're out there and they don't know good from bad. They know what's popular mm. and they know where the girl next door goes and she likes it but they don't know that it's an art form that they're learning. It's not just babysitting. So I don't know how, I don't know how you fix that. I, I just wanted to add, um, and, and it, it goes to all different styles, whether it's, I mean, there are tappers who are saying the exact same thing. Nobody knows the history of tap. For hip hop, there's Pop and Pete is still running his mouth about how nobody knows about the history. But in Europe, people are so hungry to know the history. They want to know the foundations of every style of dance. They want to know the foundations of house, of breaking, of popping, of locking. It's not just hip hop to them. They, they want to know all that. And, they, and I feel like there's that hunger there that's not really over here. It's like, nobody really cares. <laughs> and um, there's, there's like little handfuls of people, but, but there has been talk about having, doing some sort of, especially for hip hop, some sort of, Training and curriculum and some like right. some. I yeah. wonder if it has something to do with the fact that we make we. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to make a joke so bad. Yeah. I'm like, I'll pull that back mad quick. Like, oh, oh. you got it. Okay. Y'all got it. Reminds me of last Saturday night. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so I'm kidding. I'm engaged. Um, so what I I wonder if. The thing that has made us so great has also hurt us in that way, which is that it's all these competition shows. So instead of uh, delving into the history, everybody's just thinking about competing. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's what's part of that anesthet anesthetization has been. And every, it seems attainable to anybody. Any, anyone thinks, oh, I can do that, especially if you can just go on YouTube and learn a routine off of YouTube. They're, they don't realize that the people that they're watching train their whole lives <laughs> and study the history and they, there's a reason they're so good and 
you know, it just, it's, it's a, all about imitating now. They're really, really good imitators. They're so good at just imitating. Pan is too. Uh, uh, Julie, I want to ask you a question. We were talking about, uh, earlier we were talking about uh, Mia becoming a choreographer because her, her body just was not being used dancing on the stick. Is body image changing at all for dancers? Oh yeah, it's, been, it's changed like 15, even 20 years ago. I mean, not 20, maybe, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, what happened was, was uh, hip hop and street dance really started to come to the forefront and it opened people's eyes to, to different body types all different races, body types, heights, sizes, everything. It completely shifted. When I first became an agent, the girls had to be between 5'5 five five and 5'7. You could be blonde, brunette, or redhead, preferably blonde. Um, you could be African American. There was always room for one uh, in the line. Am I right? Am I right? Yes. And the men had to be between 5'8 and 6 feet 2, tall, dark, and handsome. Let me tell you, it was like that for dancers. It was a lot of, uh, you know, variety shows and films, and people just had that image of the old variety show style dancer. Mm -hmm. But everything shifted in music videos, and people started to really appreciate diversity. I mean, if you go look at Paula Abdul's Straight Up video, one of the first, you got Toledo Diamond in there, and he's just such a character. People started to appreciate um, diversity and individuality. And action, and then Jimmy Locust. Jimmy mm. Locust, uh, under five feet. Now here's a guy who defied all odds. It, it actually uh, always brought tears to my eyes. I went, that guy can do it, and anybody can do it, and still dancing. Um, I don't know, maybe, uh, he was under five feet, maybe what, four, seven, four, eight. That guy had a career. He could dance, but he also had that it factor, you know? But things like that started to shift people's perception. That's the best thing about what happened to, to dance in, in, in that in, in, since I've been doing what I've been doing is watching how it's become acceptable to be who you are. You just have to have something interesting, unique to offer. It's different. Well, that's long overdue. I think yeah. the, the body image problem came from, and I'm not downing it, but classic ballet. A ballerina was this thin, she was this tall, and there were even huge protests when one of the ballerinas in one of the major companies was not asked to come back anymore. And everybody said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're talking about 13th century dimensions. You know, this is a whole different world. But so Larry, it works for ballet. That's how what ballet is. It's a, it's got that that aesthetic. I mean, not everybody is. I mean, it's such a rarefied. It's like a thoroughbred horse. How Mark it, Morris tried to shift that around. Yeah, he, you know? yes, he did. And it, but that's like more the postmodern dance. You know, where there's a lot. So did Bill T. Jones. I mean, these yeah. guys really went for older and bald and heavy and all that. But ballet is just where it is. And so when I hear people going, you're not letting my daughter in a ballet company, and go, yeah, your daughter doesn't have the right body for ballet. Do some other, find another form of dance. I think ballet should remain the way, you know, the purity of it is really what's so beautiful about okay, it. Okay, she has a point. She's a purist, <laughs> and that can be argued. Um, okay, now I want to... Back to you, Miss Media World. How do you think what's happening in dance today addresses the nurturing and support of dancers in their careers? In other words, what we talked about are opportunities, we've talked about having fun, we've talked about being able to be ourselves, but do you see agents and Dancers Alliance and all these different kinds of organizations to giving them a, a shelter and a support that they didn't have previously? Well, it depends on what you're trying to do as a dancer. If you're trying to be a dancer in the industry, meaning not somebody who's, who's uh, a YouTube dancer that's going around teaching and stuff, but if you want to work commercially as a dancer, it's more there than I think it ever has been because, I mean, Dancers Alliance is, uh, is the most active it's ever been, creating the music video contract last year. Talk about support. We're working on tours next, talk about support. The union has been, our, our relationship with the union has been as the strongest it's ever been. So we, industry-wise, there's, there's a ton of support 
um, if that's what you're trying to do. If you're just, uh, I'm just thinking of, there, there are so many groups of dancers like, like uh, the dance crews who, or like college dance crews even, which in Southern California is a huge thing, actually all across California is a huge thing, is the, the community crews who are amazing. Their choreography is amazing and the dancing is amazing and that's what they do. Like the, there's so many things you can do now um, that is uh, encouraged by what we were talking about of you can be yourself, you can, it's a sense of fun, it's all attainable, it's all, all the new media is a great outlet for all of those things and they don't, they don't need the support of agencies and dancers and lights because they're creating their own worlds, really. Um, am I understanding the question correct, correctly? Yeah, yeah, no, you are. You okay. Are. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I think there's I think there's support all around because, like Nigel was saying, and like we all know, everybody loves dance right now. Mm -hmm. So no matter what you're trying to do, there's support because it's acceptable at more than it ever has been. I, I would say that the 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 question is. Do you want to be a professional dancer? Are you on the path to be a professional dancer? For professional dancers, I would think now is better than it's ever been. Yeah, there's a lot, there, of, opportunity. There's a lot of opportunity. You know, um, uh, uh, there's good. You know, contracts are pretty good in New York. Um, uh, here, they're as good. You know, it's artist by artist in terms of touring. But in terms of being on camera, I mean, it's the new media contracts that are gonna, you know, but that's bad for everybody. You know, that's actors, that's everybody. Everybody's struggling in that department. Um, but like, I remember when, God, Julie, I think in, when I did, one of my first movies was The Flintstones. Dancers uh, didn't have, uh, and there were only 20 of them, they didn't have trailers. And I wouldn't allow them to not have trailers. They weren't in. They weren't represented by Screen Actors Guild. Then. Right. That was the biggest fight. There's. Yeah. Bo there's Bobby Bates. She kn She knows every little detail about this. And oh when, when you know that I don't remember the year now. The year that they finally became represented by SAG. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just it's it's very recent. So this is all very very young. You know. I mean, back in. You know, people are like. God, I remember. Ah, when I was choreographing and I would get these directors who would say like, we're gonna do, it's a Coke commercial, it's gonna be Busby Berkeley and blah, and like all of this stuff. And I was thinking in my head, you know, when Busby Berkeley was choreographing, dancers were like a quarter, basically, you know? And, and thanks to people like Julie, um, dancers earn a decent wage now. And, um, and, Bobby. and Bobby, and, 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 and Bobby, Julie, Bobby, Julie, Bobby, Julie, Bobby, Julie, Bobby, Julie. Um, but, you know, thanks to those efforts, you know, when I was dancing for the short period of time that I was professionally dancing, things were like, it was like beating people. I remember some of those early Dancers Alliance meetings with Gwen Verdon. Don't you remember? I mean, like early, early days. And Michael Kidd. And Michael it. Kidd. And like that, they were like sitting in, you know, some little house in West Hollywood. I, it was like crazy. And... And, and <laughs> those were the days. <laughs> no, but um, doing the hot honey rag, all of us together. No, but um, it was, it was uh, but things are as good as they can be. The, what's strange now, though, is that people can make money dancing without being professional dancers in the commercial sense. Yeah, and that's, that's what I mean by there's... You, there's, you can do whatever the hell you want now. And the be all end all is not to be in a movie or dance behind an artist. That's not, that just isn't the case. Unless you really want to be a professional dancer, those are still your goals, but you can do anything. Mm -hmm. You can have endorsements. You can, like, that wasn't a, that was not an option. Fantastic answers. I mean, they're almost, I don't understand them. They're so good. <laughs> Because I'm from 1934. <laughs> Larry, you know more than anybody. This is a dance historian here, I'm telling you. Larry Billman is so amazing. <laughs> anyway, I, and I love about that. I love this. I love this. I love. It never is never going to stop. It's just going to go on. 
And we all have to keep making it turn, making it move. All of the ideas that, that all of the, this is the millenniums, there they are. They're gonna take it to the next step. And then they're soon gonna be trying to figure out how do we help the next group of kids on the street who've invented a dance that's off the ground. You just watch, it's all gonna happen. And, and the admiration of other countries, like when you talk about France wants to know all about what hip hop, Japan, they all want to know it's an art form. Yeah, they actually care in Japan. Mm -hmm. they, they actually study. care in Japan. They, man, yeah. and that's why they can now dance any of us at any style, at any style. It's, it's they, they study. So that's the thing, that's the cultural ambassador that the United States has to realize we have, you know, and send around the world to show the power, the diversity, the energy, the fun Canada of America. No that's, just, that's, that's, that's what they don't have. That, that, you did there, it's too, there's no diversity. Yeah, <laughs> but. Not fair, but not they fair. But got the other stuff. God doesn't give everything to everybody. <laughs> Questions. Are you guys writing down questions out there? Any of you have questions, or are you just lapping this up and understand it all? Hmm? Oh, good, collecting. I'm just going to ask a, a general question, and any of you, you all should have an opinion on this. In hindsight, excuse me, is there anything you've done differently in your life and career that you'd like to share with us? Yes. Oh, yeah. Twitch. Sorry. Okay, I'm just going to kick this off. Okay, so... Um, if I could, if I could go back and tell my past self, um, I would just tell myself to make sure that my uh, my actions aren't contradicting uh, my desires, because my uh, actually Adam Shank Shankman gave me my first job um, doing hairspray, and after I did hairspray, I was not in the mindset of like, all right, I got to hit the ground running. Here we go. After I did it, and you know, I, I'd been listening to friends saying, you know, all it takes is one job, one job, and then, you know, they'll come rolling in. And I was like, great. So I, you know, I, I did it, and, and I waited. <laughs> 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 and I waited. And then I said to myself, you know what, screw this. I'm moving back to Orange County. I'll pursue it from over there. Like, I'll show you guys. And I waited. Um, and I waited again. And it was, and, and I mean, eventually I got back on my feet, go, you know, went to So You Think You Can Dance, and, and things turned around from there. But nobody was there to tell me, like, hey, stick around, you know, and, and keep pushing, because it actually takes more than just one job, you know? It, it's, it, yeah, things roll if, if you get the one job and you keep booking as you have been doing, because then you've created a reputation from the one job that you've done, and then they see that you are continually working hard. But I just thought, okay, one job, good. And here it is, and where is it? You know, and, and, and if, I, if I would have just had somebody to uh, tell me to stick around, and, and, and keep pushing. Um, I, I think that, looking back on that, I, I definitely would have changed that, for sure. Well, because you, if you look at all the circumstances, you had, you had worked with him, maybe he wasn't working and had anything for Absolutely. you. So all of those things that got you into that project had not come together at that, that time. Was, that was a dream job, though, for dancers, because we carried those dancers for seven months. Yeah. Then we months. rehearsed in Toronto, we shot. Well, I mean, we almost never let anybody go yeah. home. It was ridiculous. Yeah. The choreography budget on that, by the way, I was the choreographer. I got none. The assistant choreographer budget on that movie was a million dollars. I know, right? I probably wrecked everything for everybody in the future. But, uh, but it was, you know, those dancers were so taken care of, um, and it was so important to me. Um, but that was, you know, it was a dream experience, so I can understand why you would think Absolutely. that that was what it was going to be forever, because it just seemed so ripe. But that was never in the thing. Um, I'm going to do my, what I would have done different, which is I would have warmed up more, <laughs> and I would have cooled down more, and I would have, if I could talk to my old self, I would have said, 
relax, relax. Everything isn't the beginning and the end of the world, except the beginning and the end of the world. But experience sort of teaches you that. You know, that sort of comes with age, that, that sense of you've got stress just it kills everything. It just it's it's very, very destructive. I think for uh, myself personally, when I moved to New York, um, when I moved to New York right out of college, I wanted to be a dancer. I wanted to be a commercial dancer, do music videos, go on a tour with a major artist. But I found myself teaching, and that kind of where was where I, the path that I took. And then when I decided to move from New York to Los Angeles, I thought this is the time to refocus on myself. I'm gonna pr really pursue my professional performance career. And then I found myself working for Answers for Dancers and into a mentorship, you know, kind of area. And so I think, you know, it's it's a blessing and a curse. I could e I could have either pushed it harder for the professional career, or I could have just gone back and told myself that it's okay to not go into that performance and do the music videos and the concerts and all of that good stuff because I still got to perform on the side, but I also got such a such a joy and such a, um, you know, it gives back so much when you get to teach and see that you've taught something in a five-year-old and they get it and they take that on with them for the rest of their lives. So I think maybe going back and saying it's okay to do something different within the industry would have maybe helped me you know, come to that conclusion sooner. I'm gonna go on to, this is really out there. Oh, Kim, where do you believe the future of dance is going? Wow, what a question. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it's just evolved so much as we've, we've heard, um, you know, with the, the social media and all of the, the TV shows as well. Um, what Adam Shankman's doing as well with all of the movies. Um, I just hope that it continues, you know, to grow like it has because it's evolved so much. Um, like the diversity that we're seeing as well with all the different dances and um, the different dance styles that we're seeing now. Um, and I think from social media as well, we're getting, you know, other countries, you know, people that can't travel or, or come here are being, are being able to see um, different forms of dance. So it's just sort of opening up all the different styles of dance and... Yeah. and I, th I think one. we all should be enthused about that. There's yeah. no limit to it. I, there's a bunch of questions here that I'm gonna now have asked to our panel. You can, anybody who wants to jump in. Kathchen says, what advice would you give to someone who is new to LA and wants to pursue a career in dancing and acting? Uh. <laughs> I say yes. Um, this is a hard, that's a hard question. I'm, I'm usually, I usually, when people ask me that, just because my personal experience was working, uh, I mean, we all just speak from our personal experience, but I try to be brutally honest because everyone's going to tell you, you have to believe in yourself, you have to be tenacious, because that's what, that's something that we all share, is that it takes a lot of hard work, that you're constantly rejected, like Nigel was saying, and you just have to keep going. You have to really love what you do, otherwise you're not gonna wanna go to the next audition. <laughs> you have to be crazy to go to 50 auditions in a month, it, and that's what we are. We're crazy about dance. You, there's no other reason you would want to step into a room and be told no so many times. But for me, the brutally honest part is, is you have to treat yourself like a product. You have to look a certain way, depend, you, you, not saying that there's a certain body type type you have to fulfill, but you have to know what your you have to know what your lane is, and once you know what your lane is, then your headshots have to be right. You have to have your reel right. You have to know how to do your hair and makeup if you're a girl. If you're a guy, you have to be in whatever shape you need to be in for whatever your lane is. You ha you have to sell yourself and give your agents the tools to be able to sell you, um, and that's something I feel like people, you know, even even if you have all of the the enthusiasm and you're being strong and you're okay with the rejection and all that stuff, but you're not doing the business part of show business, you're not going to get anywhere. <laughs> I, I would, I did a very quick answer, which is um, if you are not, first of all, if you don't have to do it, don't do it. If you do not have to do it, this is too hard. Please just stop doing it because it, it, it mucks up the atmosphere for like that, literally. 
Um, if and uh, you can't, uh, if you're not in it, then you're never going to be in it. You have to be always participating in it in some way. You cannot. I know all those people. There's. I knew a lot of very entitled dancers in my day who sat around and bitched that they weren't getting jobs, but they weren't actually. It's not that they weren't going to auditions. They weren't taking class. They weren't getting in front of choreographers. They weren't doing things. You know, I, I, you just have to always be engaged. If you're not engaged in what you want to do, then why should the uh, professional dance career just come to you begging? Right. You know, so you have to be doing all of those things. And, you, and, and, with that, and with that engagement, like make sure that you're still, you still know what you're doing and what you're here to do. Because I, I find now that, um, that don't just get engaged in the social aspect of everything, no, which on. is very, 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 very easy to do. And even in the class setting, because now you, you, fall, you, you fall into, into the, um, you know, I'm going to take class with my friends. It's not necessarily class that's pushing me, and it's not necessarily a class of somebody that might be choreographing or a style that I need to work on that I see out there. Um, and you, you fall into that, and you think because you are hanging out, and because you are going to take this certain class with friends that you are training, you are not. So you have to be very, very aware of that. Very aware. I was going to say, if you've just moved here, this is a really tough city to navigate. So I always tell people, give yourself two years. If you don't love it, you, but you have, to, you have to give yourself a break constantly. Don't, you can't be so hard on yourself all the time. You have to take the right steps, but you've got to be good to yourself. This is a very hard city to navigate. You want to be an actor and a dancer at the same time. I don't know who asked the question, how old you are, but you probably should take equal focus and equal dedication. So if you don't, you, and you have to, you have to be in class. You have to be in class all the time. If you're a dancer, you have to be in class, but if you want to act, you also have to be in those classes. You can't just say you want to be an actor. That's one of the hardest transitions to make for dancers. And they always say they want to act, but they're, most of them are unwilling to make the sacrifices, which really means staying in town and taking those three hour, those, those, those kind of classes where you're committed for 12 weeks or something like that. And it's, 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 a, it's something that you have to, you know, if you're not sure, then that's fine. Figure, but you got to figure it out eventually. And you can always go to Answers for Dancers. <laughs> <laughs> There's a big community of everybody who's more than willing to help out and offer any advice or anything that they've learned in their own experiences. So come on. <laughs> okay, this is for Kim from Ian Ray Hawk. Do you have any plans to open up a chain of dance studios? Eventually, I'm sure I will. Uh, but it's such a commitment, and I'm not ready for that just yet because I'd like to be, you know, hands-on with it. So, um, yeah, eventually I, I would love to open up, you know, a dance school. I love it's a chain. Yeah, a chain. <laughs> like yeah, you, you, a chain. You, you shot past yeah, the studio. Like, you you had... forget just the one studio. <laughs> yeah, I'll have my empire um, <laughs> here and in Australia. No, yeah, eventually one day I think that would be nice to do, to, to give back. Good think. question, but she's right. That's, that's a major investment, time and all of that. But it's, it, it seems like a natural for someone of her abilities. Okay, from Kate Ford to anyone, did you finish university? If so, how did you keep up with your dance classes? I didn't. I did. <laughs> um, I went to Penn State online while I was touring, while I was working on movies, and it was amazing. And that's one thing I certainly don't regret. We were talking about things that we regret. That's one thing that I'm so happy I did. My graduation day was one of the proudest moments of my life. And I was working on Camp Rock in Toronto, and before, which, was, which worked over several months, and my graduation fell in that work time. And I, before I accepted the job, I was like, I can do it, but there's one day that I have to miss to go to my graduation. If I can't miss that day, I can't do the job. And they let me go, and I wrapped, like, we wrapped in the afternoon on a Friday. I flew to Toronto for my graduation. As soon as the ceremony was done, I flew back to work. But it's the, the, the fact that you have the opportunity to go to school online and work at the same time right now is, from the time that I went to school, it's, it's come leaps and bounds past what was offered when I went to college. 
Um, so for me, it was just, there's so much downtime when you're working, when you're on set, when you're on tour, if you're on a tour bus, when you're flying, even in <coughs> rehearsals sometimes, you're just sitting there. And I would be studying and talking about being caught up in social stuff, and I was not a social dancer. I wouldn't, I, if I was going to a club, it's because I, per, I was performing. So I would be on the tour, I was touring with Snoop Dogg, and I was on the tour bus, and they're all, you know, doing what you would do if you were touring with Snoop Dogg. But, <laughs> um, but I'd be doing my homework, and everyone thought, I mean, it was, it was great, and I was studying law, and he knows a lot about law. <laughs> so we would talk about law, and it's, you know, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to fall into the stereotypical mold of what you think a dancer is doing. Um, you can be going to school now, and a lot, a lot of people now are going to school while they're, wor while they're working because you can do it online. Um, so that's how I juggled it, because you can do it online, but if you want to physically go, then that's a whole other story. I actually went to Penn State. So yeah. I went to, in Pennsylvania, because I'm from Pennsylvania, but I, because Penn State is such a humongous campus, um, at the main campus, there's like 50,000 students, probably more now, but there's literally any type of club that you could want to participate in is available to you. So my freshman year, I found a tap dance company that was a Penn State affiliated club, and I went in and I auditioned, and, and then I found a hip hop company that did all genres, and so I still got to perform and keep up with it while I was actually physically at school. So the opportunities are there. You know, a lot of schools have dance minor programs, you know, dance major programs, you can double major, major have a minor, so the opportunities are there, you just have to take your resources and, and do the research. Okay, this is for, for Twitch. How was your experience on So You Think You Can Dance? Was it stressful? Uh, it was, yeah, uh, yes. Uh, it was, uh, it, my, my experience on So You Think You Can Dance was a lot of things down from the, uh, the beginning of the audition process. Um, the first time I auditioned for So You Think, I auditioned completely on a whim. Um, I, just, I just heard the season three auditions were going on the next day, so I went. And I went right down to the end, the last spot for a guy, and they chose the other guy, so I knew I was going back the next season. So I went back, and uh, things weren't going right. This was, my, this was my screw you phase. I'm going to Orange County. This was this, this phase. So that, down to my last wire, I said that um, if I did not make it on the show, that I was going to go to the Navy. Um, literally, the time that I was cut, I was going to go to the enlistment. I'm, I'm an extreme guy. It's either black or white, you know? It's, it's so, so with that, you know, it's, um, so thank God I, I made the show. And um, it was, everything was, it was stressful, but every, literally every moment is a blessing. Literally, every single moment. I, um, I learned how to dance. I danced barefoot, um, you know, I danced in tights. I met the love of my life when I'm getting married in December. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was stressful, but it was, it, was a it was a good stress to have, a very good stress to have. I just realized, mm -hmm. it was you and Joshua, right? That were yeah. the, okay, because I, I assisted Wade on that last right. uh -huh. episode, and mm -hmm. they, got, they got, they were, you were both like in the hospital. In the hospital. Yes. And we had to dance the, the number for the tech, like the choreographers and yeah. And the, yeah. Uh, so t when you're talking about stress, like they do the physical stress mm -hmm. of what you're doing. I mean, they were in the hospital. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we came we came in that day of the finale. We got out of the hospital that morning, rushed over to the studio, did our techs on stage, ran upstairs, got on the IV, and went back down. It was yeah, made it happen. And that whole season, I had to pretend I'd never met you. <laughs> <laughs> and after hairspray. Right, exactly. <laughs> but I, I was always mean to you, so it was fine. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. I just had to vote you off constantly. Right. <laughs> we have a question up to either Adam or to Kim. What is your process when you're choreographing? Ladies first, what's your process? Uh, well, on Dance With The Stars, I'm not um, teaching professionals, so it's kind of a different process. Uh, I'm teaching people that don't know how to dance. Um, and everyone's so very different, you know, like right. I mentioned Jerry Springer, and then you, you'll get an athlete. Um, so my process is I, I have to get the best out of them. So I find out, you know, about them as, as people, what they like, what music they like, um, things that they can do. Uh, so it really varies on who I'm dancing with, with or, or who it's for because I have to make them shine. 
Um, but I liked things to be theatrical and, and tell a story. You obviously have a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a really fun process. Uh, Jason Gilkerson, he actually was the one that really taught me how to choreograph. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it, it, sometimes you can be up all night um, trying to think of things and, and it can be quite stressful at times, but other times it'll be very easy um, to, do, to do. Yeah, but it just varies every, every single time. I hope my feelings are always with the dancers. I can imagine it'd be like first day of school, they all run to the board, you know, who am I getting this year? <laughs> and yeah. I, I was going to ask you, the thing that, that really I love about Dancing with the Stars is you see so-called ordinary people suddenly dance. And I find that athletes, because they, are, they have technique yeah. and they have discipline, can process it quite well. And a Latin man can shake his hips. I mean, I, I'm so sad I was born in a white bread <laughs> resident. So and I'm, what would you prefer to have as a, as a partner? Do you have when any of us, um, you know, get told we have we've got an athlete, we're very excited because the athletes, you know, naturally are very agile. They're very fit, um, especially the football players. Uh, they're basically dancing on the field half of the time. Um, so it's always great when you get an athlete. Um, I actually pushed myself so hard with one of the athletes I had. Um, I tried to do so many crazy lifts with him. Speaking of, of YouTube, I was um, stuck for some tricks, and it was salsa, which I don't normally do. So I was looking for some tricks on YouTube. I watched the World Salsa Colombian Champions, and they did this crazy trick. And I was like, I can do that. So stupidly, with um, Heinz Ward, a football player, I said, I know how to do it, the grip. So I tried it out on him and ended up with a really bad injury and him falling on top of me. Uh, but that was, you know, for a dance competition, it was like the semi-finals. It was all for a mirror ball, which is so ridiculous. But you know, when you're in the when you're in the moment, it's like I want that mirror ball trophy. You know, <laughs> and where can I do this trick? And um, the two of us, were, we actually did it once, um, barely. Um, and then, yeah, it, I ended up in hospital on a stretcher and stuff. But that was a case of me being silly, making someone who, d you know, is not a dancer. Yeah. Try and do this trick. Well, that's with a very me. specific process, yeah. quite different from the way that you would work because you're assuming that people can do other than your stars. Yeah. What's your process? Well, that's that's its own thing. But I mean, I I learned very on very early on that if I God Tina, you know, from try from working with our, I'm bad at like just trying to think of steps. If if steps for steps sake, which for a long time was the fashion in music video. Um, where it was, uh, and I, I stunk at that. When I kind of fell into my pocket was when I realized I was uh, better with character and story, and that the movement that came out of character and story, because uh, I stressed about steps. Once I threw steps out of my head, then suddenly I started getting much better, and I, I sort of found my niche. So as a result of that, my process starts with the music and the characters. Period, end of story. I hear the music, I hear the characters, and it reveals itself to me very, very quickly. It's, um, you know, when I, um, the last big thing I choreographed was that Oscars a few years ago, and um, I was literally stuck until the nominees came out. And once I knew what the nominated scores were, because I did a big piece for the nominated scores, I mean, literally that opening number that I did with uh, Neil Patrick Harris, once I'd heard the song, I actually choreographed it, and I am not kidding, in 20 minutes. The whole thing. And that was like a crazy... Um, I did the same thing with It's Hairspray. On Hairspray, the girls doing the thing like that, 15 minutes. I did that in because the song just spoke to me, and I knew what it was. And so if I'm there, it's all good. Um, if I don't, if it's somebody's just saying like, I want, oh God, do you, uh, I don't know if people still do this anymore. Go like, I just want to see something new and fresh and something that nobody's ever done or seen. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? Like that, like that, that just doesn't exist. Do you know what I mean? It's all about your take on it and trying to, you know, your thing. And there are some incredible um, technology now that's available to people, you know, like, um, on the shows, we get to do things with hydraulics now and things that we didn't, you know, it's cool. Like, people can kind of express their visions 
more. Um, Cirque du Soleil has really pushed us a lot, I think, because people are really used to that now. Um, but my process literally begins with the music and the character. It's like good old fashioned meat and potatoes kind of thinking. Good answers, good answers. Um, I always remember Michael Kidd, his first thing when he came on our project, why are these people dancing? Exactly. Is what he asked. That is the question to ask. Why is this number happening? It's, you know, it's the age old adage, when you, when you feel too much to talk, you sing. If you feel too much to step, you kick and do things. Not like that. <laughs> A lot of them for Adam. Who's this Adam everybody's asking questions for? Have I'm the guy that can hire everybody. That's who oh. I am. Are you kidding me? Oh. <laughs> okay, here. And this one's right on your target, if you'll pardon the expression. What advice can you give to a dancer who wants to learn some tools on pitching an idea to a producer? Oh, okay. That's good. Um, uh, um, <laughs> It's, per it's perfect for a dancer because it's all about preparation and timing. And, you know, first of all, have your idea thought out, like really, really thought out, because if I'm gonna, if I, don't let me poke holes in your, you know, treatment or thing like that. Like, I don't wanna hear a lot of like, I don't know. You know, there, I, can, I can have a little bit of I don't know, but not a lot of it. Um, uh, don't badger anybody. If you're getting resistance, respect that. Because you don't know what that person is going through at any given time. Respectfully ask if you can have a word with them or talk to them or do something. Um, and that's where the timing comes in. You know, know your audience. Go after what is, you think, feasible in mind. If you have a really, 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 I mean, it depends. If you're talking about a movie, you know, you're not a writer. I would probably, if you're talking about a movie, I would probably find a writer friend or somebody so that it's developed because what you're putting me as a producer in the position to do, uh, if you come to me with a movie idea, that makes me do a bunch of work. Like I have to go to find a writer and I'm gonna do a thing like, and, you're gonna, and your idea is gonna make me work really hard. So I would have some of your resources kind of figured out as best possible. Um, uh, TV ideas are easy because those are an evolving thing. You know, you, you don't have to understand all of it uh, at first, but you're sort of like, like Glee. It's about a Glee club. And in every episode, um, they would sing, you know, these X amount of numbers. And I'm like, hmm, that's not a bad, you know, I mean, there's those kinds of things. I mean, um, as opposed to like cop rock, where if anybody remembers cop rock, that was like, okay, it's about cops and they dance. <laughs> I would have, I, I would have been, on the other hand, who knows, because A, it got on the air, and B, can you imagine being in the room during the pitch for Flashdance? Okay, here it is. <laughs> She's a steel worker. <laughs> but at night, she's like a modern performance artist who's really great and kind of a stripper. but it's really pretty and cool. I mean, the whole thing, and by the way, she's a maniac. Like, I mean, I can't, <laughs> likes to have sex on her I mean, the whole thing, I would have been in that room, that must have been the most cocaine pot-fueled pitch room, like, I love this man, oh, this is gonna be awesome. Like, like, that's crazy. So you never know where that next gem is gonna come from. It, it was, you know, I mean, I remember, I remember a friend of mine went and auditioned for the part of Baby in Dirty Dancing when it was just getting geared up and she asked me to read the script and I read the script and I went, no, oh, buddy, it's so Jewish. Like, what are you talking? That's how much I know. So, you know, you never know. There are certain ideas which are going to speak to you and other ones that are not going to speak to you. And by the way, if you do pitch me something and I, and I don't respond to it, I'm not the only producer in town. There's a ton of people out there. You know, that's what I mean by you have to be in the game to get in the game. You know, you have to keep working and keep your eye on everybody and know what everybody does and respect what everybody does. Respect those craft service people. Respect everybody. Do not be entitled. You never know who someone's gonna become. I am living proof. <laughs> like, you know. It's, uh... Gotta end on that.
I mean, it's really true. Everything that he says is true. I can't thank them enough. Please show them how much you appreciated having them here. Great.